Thank you for listening to this forum podcast. Please check out our website for a rich archive of podcasts and writing from contemporary philosophers and other researchers on a wide variety of topics. The Forum is an educational charity dedicated to bringing academic philosophy to a broader audience. Please consider donating to us via our Just Giving page, which you can find on our website. Happy listening. Good evening, everyone. Hello and welcome to the Forum. Now, as you may know, the Forum is a non-profit organization, and we run events that are entirely open to everyone and free, and that's because of people like you helping to support us. So if you do want to help fund the Forum, you can do so via our webpage. And while you're there, you'll find a selection of podcasts from previous events and lots of essays from philosophers, so do check out the website. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me up there? Yes. Great. Okay, so on that note, tonight's event is also being recorded for a podcast, and in fact, we're being live streamed. So do bear that in mind if you want to ask a question. There's a roving microphone, and the microphone will come to you, so wait for that. Please also do turn your phones to silent, but don't turn them off. Feel free to tweet along. We've got our own hashtag. It's ha hashtag L-S-E-F-E-P. And you're very welcome to uh, take photos and comment along on Twitter. <coughs> now, before we get going with tonight's great event, a quick public service announcement. Next week, next forum event, the young Wittgenstein isn't going to be in the LSE. It's at the Royal Institute of philosophy and the directions are in the brochure and on our web page so do remember that right I think we're all warmed up we'll get started marriage what is it and what have sex religion politics and economics got to do with it is there any distinctive moral value in it should the state promote it is it possible to have an equal marriage, or is marriage fundamentally an oppressive institution? Should it be rejected in favor of civil partnerships, or something else, or perhaps nothing else? I'm Sarah Fine. I'm a lecturer in philosophy at King's College London and a fellow here at the Forum. And with me to discuss these very interesting ideas tonight, we have a very exciting panel. We have Dr. Claire Chambers, who teaches philosophy at the University of Cambridge. She is the author of Against Marriage, an Egalitarian Defense of the Marriage-Free State, which was published last year. And I think that gives us a little bit of a clue about where Claire stands on some of these issues. We have Sir Paul Coleridge, who is a former High Court judge and founder and chairman of the Marriage Foundation, which seeks, I quote, to confront the scourge of family breakdown by championing long-lasting, stable relationships within marriage. And at the end, we have Peter Tatchell, who, as you know, is a human rights campaigner. He's director of the Peter Tatchell Foundation and is a prominent supporter of the Equal Civil Partnerships campaign, about which I'm sure we'll be hearing more tonight. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. So the first question, of course, is what is marriage? And I'm going to start with Paul. Can I just... I'm amazed to see so many people here tonight, and it's great that you are all here, but it is an extraordinary thing, isn't it, that we're having a debate about marriage and its validity. If you had suggested 30, 40, 50 years ago that marriage was something which should be questioned you'd have been regarded as raving mad. I mean, it was so much part of society by, if you like, by default, that the idea of having a debate about its, its worth and its validity to individuals and to society would have been thought of uh, as quite ridiculous. So I think it's interesting that we're here tonight to discuss it. And speaking for myself, I think it's a good thing because so many of the things that we take for granted are... Uh, things that have just gone on for a very long time and therefore we think they should just carry on. And uh, I, I can think of many other examples, but uh, marriage is something 
that it is good to put under the microscope occasionally so that those who would advocate uh, it and, uh, and uh, are in favour of, of its continuation uh, can think about what, and articulate why they think it is uh, so important to our society. That's my first point. The second point is just to tell you a little bit more about where I come from. I, the fact that I'm a High Court judge or was a High Court judge is neither here nor there. What is more uh, perhaps important and drives what I do and what drove me to set up Marriage Foundation four, uh, six years ago now was spending 45 years in the family justice system just down the road here in the Royal Courts of Justice, first as a barrister, <laughs> then as a judge, the last 15 years as a judge in the family division, dealing with the fallout from broken relationships and broken marriage day after day after day after day and watching as the rate of family breakdown just grew inexorably during the uh, 80s and 90s and, and beyond. In fact, uh, we have the highest rate in this country, we, are, we have the highest rate of family breakdown of any developed nation. And that is not a statistic we should be proud of. And so it, it, I began to think that sitting there day in, day out, dealing with individual cases was not what I wanted to do anymore. I wanted to confront the whole question of why we were allowing society to get into this situation where so many relationships broke down and what the uh, and what the solutions might be. And it was that that drove me to set up the foundation and what we are about more than anything else, uh, although the umbrella title uh, is, as it were, shorthand, is about confronting the terrible problems caused by family breakdown and, in particular, the problems caused to children. And funnily enough, last night I was at a fascinating talk given by an American lady who specializes in this uh, when we talk about children, we always think of toddlers, don't we, and 11, 12-year-olds, people under the age of 18. She has written a really interesting book on the terrible problems caused to adult children when their families break down. So the idea that this is just something that we need to be, be thinking about intelligently as a society because it affects uh, children in particular is right, but it's adult children as well, and sometimes in their 20s and 30s, if families break up, they can suffer hugely. So that's a little bit of introduction. That's where I come from on this. And I'm not at all doctrinaire. I'm not interested in names. I don't care whether people call themselves married, civil partners, or they can form a limited company as far as I'm concerned, providing, providing they enter into a relationship which is a committed one. And I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. But the thing to remember about marriage is that it is a huge success story. First of all, it's been around since forever in every society that, that has ever been. And even now, it represents 80% of the cohabiting population of this country. So although there is a lot of talk of the increase in cohabitation, and indeed there has been a very significant increase in the number of people who live together in an informal way since the early 1980s, where there's been a huge spike, the fact remains, whatever you may think, that the vast majority of the population, when they turn to the question of children in particular, uh, in fact want to marry. That's, so it's a huge success story in that sense. It's also a success story in the sense that all polling always shows that children between the ages of 14 and 18, their main aspiration in life is to have a stable married relationship that lasts, that endures for their life. Why is that? For the simple reason that as a species we are hardwired to want reliable love. And it doesn't matter what sex you are, where you come from, we all have that visceral need for reliable, trustworthy love and it is more often found within a married uh, uh, relationship than anywhere else. Because of, and I shall now move on to my last point, this, this whole question of commitment. What makes the difference between a cohabiting relationship and a married relationship? The answer in a word is this funny word, commitment. What that means is that two people 
At the same time, in a married situation, obviously in a public uh, situation, stand up in front of their friends, relations, and anybody else who's lucky enough to be invited, and say, in, sometimes in rather old-fashioned language, I want, to, I want to be with you for the rest of my life, and the other person says the same. And they say it in terms of, I know what you're like, I know what your history is, I nevertheless am going to commit to you for the rest of my life. And this is a mutual commitment, as you know. Now, that seems to be the difference between uh, relationships which last and the relationships which uh, are less uh, stable. And the statistics are completely overwhelming. I'm not going to bore you with statistics too much tonight. I could do that if you wanted. But I have with me tonight our research director. If you want statistics, he can talk statistics all night, I promise you. But the simple fact is that married relationships are three times more likely to last uh, for uh, life than uh, than unmarried relationships. That's statistic, that's statistic number one you need to remember tonight. The other uh, statistic you need to remember is that as we sit here tonight, half the 15-year-olds in this country no longer live with both their birth parents, which is a very, very serious problem and is probably underlies a huge number of the problems we uh, face as a society. But of the half that do live with their birth parents, by the age of, by the time they're taking their GCSEs, if you like, 93% of those people are married. And so there is no argument about this. This is no longer controversial. This research is not done uh, by us particularly, although a lot of it we have replicated. This is stuff that comes from uh, heart, very good data and research, much of it done in this country, but even more done in America. And what does, does that matter? It matters hugely to children. Because on every measure of success, and again, this is no longer controversial, children from stable homes, and that doesn't, I agree, doesn't mean uh, you have to be married, but you're far, far more likely to find stability within a married uh, situation than you do in, uh, in an unmarried one. And that just happens to be the data. And so from the, point of view of, from the point of view of children, which is what I'm concerned about, that is why we champion marriage. So can I ask you in a nutshell, when you talk about marriage, what exactly is it that you're talking about? So how many people do you have in mind? Do you, do you want to say something? You know, are we just talking about a man and well, a as woman? Far as, no, no, no. I'm talking about two individuals uh, who make a commitment to each other. And I'm not talking about the polygamous marriages. That, is, that defies the whole concept of, of, of marriage, in my opinion. The, the whole purpose of marriage is an exclusive relationship between two people. Once you start saying, well, uh, you can have five or six wives, it's nearly always wives, you notice, um, then uh, you're, in, you're talking about a completely different uh, setup. And uh, I, I, I'm not uh, talking about that. No, I'm talking about uh, a, a, a committed relationship between two individuals. Claire. Thank you so much. Well, I've got various sort of responses to make to Paul. I'll save most of them for our next section where I think we're going to be talking about the normative implications. Um, but just to say that it's, it's not true to say that 30 or 40 years ago we wouldn't have even been considering marriage. I mean, feminists have been criticising the institution of marriage for, for centuries. Um, John Stuart Mill was by no means the first, and he wrote in the late 19th century um, that marriage was the primitive state of slavery lasting on. So this is not a new debate. Um, but the question you asked, Sarah, was what is marriage? And I think when we think of marriage, we think of two sorts of things. We think of weddings, right? We think of a ceremony, a, a celebration, <coughs> vows, a dress, bridesmaids, speeches, presents. We think of that kind of party aspect of marriage, the, the, the wedding. And then we think of a relationship. We think of love. We think of commitment. We think of family, stability. Now, none of these, or at least certainly not the, the, the second set of things, the things that we value in terms of a relationship of love, commitment, stability, and so on, are distinct to marriage. Um, not all marriages are stable. Not all marriages actually retain that commitment. Not all marriages contain love. Many non-married people 
have those things in their relationships. They have loving, committed, stable relationships. So when we're thinking about marriage and distinguishing marriage from other forms of relationship or other ways of life, what for me we're really thinking about is the role of the state. And when we think about the relationship of marriage, we're thinking about a re relationship that is recognized by the state in a certain sort of way. And it's that that my, my book, Against Marriage, is criticizing, the role of the state in recognizing marriage, particularly. <clears throat> now, what does the state do when it recognizes marriage? Well, it does three things. It defines what marriage is, it endorses marriage, and it regulates marriage. So I'll just talk about each of those in turn. So firstly, defining marriage. So, I mean, as a relationship regulated and recognized by the state, the state says how many people can be married, whether they have to be of the same sex or different sex, whether they have to be of a certain age, whether they have to be of certain religions, what kind, whether there can be um, relationships that are marital within people of different religions or races. So the state defines access, controls access to marriage. Um, and in doing so, the state sets the meaning of marriage. So if the state says marriage must be between one man and one woman and they must be, um, take vows which have a recognizably Christian character or something of that kind, then the state is making a declaration about what marriage is. It's a relationship of a particular traditional Christian sort, for example. If the state says actually we should also recognize marriages between same-sex couples and the key feature of those marriages is that they should be in some sense committed monogamous relationships, it's making a different kind of statement about what constitutes a marriage, that a marriage is a relationship of love and commitment regardless of sexuality and sex. So the state defines what marriage is, and in doing so it makes a claim about meaning. And that claim about meaning is necessarily going to fit with some people's understandings of marriage and some people's understandings of what's valuable and important and conflict with other people's. So the state is making a claim about what marriage is. So the state defines marriage. And secondly, it endorses marriage. So when the state recognizes marriage, it says there is something about this kind of relationship that is special, that is superior, that is a better way of living than other kinds of relationship, and also than living in a different family form without that kind of coupled relationship. So in recognizing marriage, the state says, this is a way of life that we, as a state, as a society, endorse above other ways of life. There's something more important, more valuable, superior to this way of life than alternatives. And as I say, that's both, that can both represent a claim that certain kinds of couple relationships are more important than others. So if you have a scenario where only different sex relationships are recognized as marriage, that clearly represents a kind of heterosexist claim that um, heterosexual relationships are more valuable than um, homosexual relationships. So it can be something like that, where a very clear form of inequality. But even if marriage is reformed and it's opened up to include same-sex couples, it's opened up to include a variety, you know, religion and race are no longer a barrier and so on, nevertheless it's saying there is something uniquely special about a committed, sexual, um, monogamous couple relationship. And that people who live in other family forms perhaps single parent families who are divorced, who are separated, who live alone, who live with siblings, who live with friends, aren't achieving that high level of, um, of respectability that we, the state, wants to declare. And that, I think, is a problem, and I'll explain why later on. The third thing that the state does when it recognizes marriage is it regulates. Right? It regulates personal relationships. It says what is um, permitted, and it says what legal rights and duties come from being married. And the key feature of, of marriage, as I understand it, as I philosophize it, is that when the state recognizes marriage, it gives a bundle of rights and duties to married people. And it gives that bundle of rights and duties to married people simply because they're married, and not because their relationship is necessarily different in any other way from another relationship. So for example, a married couple will typically get a bundle of rights and duties concerning matters such as uh, parenthood, uh, property ownership, migration, next of kinship, inheritance tax, and so on. A big bundle of rights and duties that come together to the married couple. And they get that bundle simply because they're married and not because their relationship is in any other way different because you could have an unmarried um, couple in every other way identical that doesn't get that same bundle. 
And again, in doing that, the state is making a declaration about the kinds of relationship practices that it thinks should go together. And it's making a claim about the right way of living and the right sort of default assumption for family forms. Um, and I'll say later what I think is wrong with that. Okay, fantastic. I have a feeling we're already going to get a debate going over here, but I'm going to go to Peter first, and then we'll open up to the floor. Peter, what is marriage? Well, first let me say a huge thanks to the Forum for European Philosophy for hosting this meeting uh, and the LSE for giving us this room because today there's far too little public debate about these kinds of issues, and it's great that you're all here and engaged to <coughs> think about not what is, but perhaps question what is, and also think about what could be. Uh, my starting point is, of course, marry ha marriage has a history, a long history, an ancient <coughs> history, and it's not a very nice history. Um, you know, we think of marriage today as being all about love and commitment, and for many people it is. But going back in time, marriage was never about love and commitment. It was first and foremost about the male control of women and children. And in particular, the male sexual control of women to regulate women's sexuality and reproduction within a particular framework. Um, very much in order to guarantee paternity and property rights so that you could, through marriage, as closely as possible determine that the child born in this relationship was the child of the father and therefore the rightful inheritor of his property, if he had any. And it was very much a bourgeois institution of the wealthy, the powerful, people who had things at stake, in particular property. So that's sort of the background to marriage as an institution. And although it has evolved, and nowadays it's much more co-equal and you know, there's much more romance and love and uh, what have you involved, we still see residues of that historic patriarchy. So for example, still in many, many instances, it will be the father of the bride giving away his daughter to the husband-to-be, symbolizing the passing of women from one man to another. And even the language, the language of husband and wife, husband. The other meaning of husband is to manage and control, which does in many cases denote the way in which men have traditionally treated women and children within marriage. So we can see evolution and change but we do see residues as well. The other point I'd say is that having said this, I think so far we've come at this from a rather Eurocentric angle because we're not looking at the way in which marriage exists in many parts of the world today where patriarchy and misogyny are ingrained in the institution of marriage. Uh, we have arranged marriages, forced marriages, or marriages where family and clan and religious tradition often dictates who marries who. So it's not really a free choice in the sense that many of us would know it. And I think we need to be mindful that the hundreds of millions, at least hundreds of millions of women in particular, who don't necessarily enter marriage in large parts of the world of a free choice, but because of parental, community, and religious diktats. Um, if I can look at briefly at same-sex marriage. Um, the battle for same-sex marriage uh, in Britain began in 1992 when five couples from the LGBT group Outrage filed an application <coughs> for marriage rights at Westminster Register Office in Marlowe Road. Um, of course, the registrar said, oh, you can't get married. It's, you know, <coughs> marriage is for men and women. And we said, well, excuse me, would you like to go and look at the Marriage Act? And the registrar, I remember, came back ashen-faced because the Marriage Act of 1949, which is to this day the main legislative framework, does not specify that marriage partners have to be male and female. 
That stipulation was only introduced in Britain in 1971 with the introduction of the Nullity of Marriage Act, which was later amended to and incorporated into the Matrimonial Causes Act of, I think, 1973. Yep. Um, and it's only since that time, 1971, that same-sex marriage has been unlawful in this country. So eventually, of course, the, the, the registrar did a hurried phone call to the Home Office to find out what you should do, and of course she was eventually informed about the legislation in the Matrimonial Causes Act. So the couple were not successful. Uh, but the battle continued all through the years, right up until 2012, 2013 and 14, when same-sex marriage eventually became law. In fact, in 2011, uh, I helped organise a case to the European Court of Human Rights where four same-sex couples filed an application against the ban on same-sex marriage and four opposite-sex couples filed an application against the ban on uh, opposite-sex civil partnerships. When the civil partnership law was introduced in 2003, the Labour government made it immediately clear this would apply to only to same-sex couples. And hand on heart, the only organisation in the country that rebelled against that and protested was the LGBT group outrage. We said, we want equality, and if straights aren't getting equality, then we don't want equality either. And so we very much lobbied the government in 2003, when the legislation was first proposed, to ensure there was equality in civil partnerships as well as same-sex marriage. And here we are, 14 years later, getting on for nearly 15 years later, and still opposite-sex couples do not have the right to have a civil partnership. And I was furiously typing away at the beginning because on Friday, a private member's bill is before the House of Commons to allow opposite-sex couples, that's male-female couples, to have a civil partnership. But at this 11th hour, the government having previously said it would agree to legalise opposite-sex civil partnerships, as a result of the recent government reshuffle and the change in ministers, the government has rode back and they're now saying they're not willing to agree to the bill on Friday and they want more time. Shame. More time. They've already had 14 years. Shame, shame. They've already been told by the High Court and the Court of Appeal, time is up. They've told, been told they must come to a decision. They keep on saying we need more time. I mean, way back in 2012, when the same-sex marriage consultation was undertaken, um, I managed to persuade Lynn Featherston, the minister in charge, to include a supplementary question on whether there should be equal civil partnerships for opposite-sex couples, and to her credit, she agreed. But to her great surprise, <laughs> and the government's great surprise, 61% of the over 200,000 people who responded said, yes, civil partnerships should be open to opposite-sex couples. Only 24% disagreed. So since 2012, the government's own consultation has said clearly that a majority of the public do support civil partnership equality. And we know from what we've done in terms of the adding up the votes in Parliament that if there was a free vote in Parliament on Friday, a majority of MPs would vote for it. So here we are. We're, we're still not quite there, even on civil partnerships, let alone perhaps an alternative to marriage and civil partnerships, which I'll talk about later on, because, after all, basically civil partnerships are marriage light. Mm. It's the same basic model with a different name and a few minor differences. What I'm going to say later on is we need a whole new framework. We need to start from scratch and rethink a modern, flexible, democratic alternative. Mm. OK, wonderful. Thank you. So what we're going to do in a moment is go on to think about this question of whether or not states ought to promote marriage. And we're also going to be thinking, as Peter has already introduced, about this question of alternatives to marriage. But before we do that, we've already heard some very um, interesting things. And I wonder, does anybody have any questions about what the panel have said so far? Raise your hand if you have a question and we'll pass the roving mic to you. 
Okay, we've got a question over here. <coughs> Thank you very much uh, to all the speakers. That was all really interesting material. Um, I'd like to pick up on something that uh, Sir Paul raised in his opening speech when he said that um, he thought polygamous marriage was something entirely different to monogamous marriage. Um, and given the premise that seemed to be the working premise of the panel that in contemporary society, love and commitment are the main measures, uh, you know, the, the main features of what people look for in a marriage. I'm interested in the entire panel's view on whether or why that's not compatible with polygamous marriage. Thank you very much. And before we answer that, there's a question right over there. And you've got your mic. Hi, it's another question for Sir, Sir Paul. Um, I'm interested in the Marriage Foundation's view on equal access to civil partnerships for straight couples and whether... Uh, you might or all of the panel might be involved in some lobbying activities around that ahead mm. of Friday. Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much. So we've got the question about polygamous marriages and the question about equal civil partnerships. And let's start with Paul. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a point of view. I just happen to think that when we're talking about marriage this evening, I am, I, in my mind, I'm afraid, am, am thinking of a monogamous, exclusive relationship as marriage if you want to, uh, I mean, you can, you can devalue the definition so that it has no meaning at all if you want. Uh, but I think that the, the idea of an exclusive committed relationship between two people is very, very special. And if you're going to open it up to relationships with uh, any number of other people, I, am, I, I, I'm, I'm, I would be totally against it. I think you produce a totally different psychology. And my experience of any kind of polygamous ar ar arrangement is that women do, in, in opposite-sex marriages, uh, women do far, far worse and, uh, uh, and are hugely prejudiced. And funny enough, I spent a lot of time with um, the uh, Latter-day Saints community, the, the um, Mormon community, uh, out at Brigham Young University uh, la uh, last year, um, talking to them. And I asked them, obviously, what their, uh, what, what their position was on polygamy. Uh, and, of course, it, it, it isn't a position because they haven't had polygamous marriages there since 1880, although we all go on saying, oh, well, the Mormons are giggle, giggle. They have lot, hundreds of wives. Actually, it hasn't been since, turn, since before the turn of the 19th century, let alone the 20th century. But th those who were old enough to remember their parents and their mothers said they loathed it. All the women hated it. And uh, the idea that this was some jolly, easy, relaxed uh, arrangement for people to move between different partners is, I'm afraid, a male myth, as so many often, so often these uh, myths are. And so uh, I, uh, I very much strongly feel that uh, I'm talking about uh, a committed relationship between two people. Can I just answer quickly the same, uh, the, the civil partnerships? Marriage Foundation is strongly in favor of civil partnerships and has been since day one because we are not concerned about names, and I'm with Peter on this. I, I don't think it matters what you call it. What matters is what is going on between the couple. And if, for some reason or other, logical, illogical, whatever, people prefer not to be called husband and wife, fine. I mean, absolutely fine if what you have done is formed a committed relationship. As I say, form it into a limited company if you want, or whatever you like, but, um, uh, but, but uh, and don't let us get hung up, as some of the Christian community do, on this idea of marriage, because it's called marriage, or there's husband and wife. These are roles which suit us at a particular time, and I was interested in Peter's history lesson, uh, I remember learning all about the history of marriage as a law student, and it, it, of course it, it was horrible. I mean, if you go back, and you have to remember, until 1893, women could not own property at all. Some might say, anyway, I'll show and go. Uh, anyway, you, you couldn't, until, quite, until the end of the 19th century, married women were not allowed to own property. Everything went across to their husbands. I mean, it just seems so archaic and extraordinary now, but that was the situation. So... Yes, we're certainly in favour of civil partnerships, and I shall be talking to Peter later about how we can perhaps uh, address this, because it's, 
It's very sad, and I also agree with him, that to have, actually we're making a terrific fuss about it at the moment, but there is no real distinction between marriage and civil partnerships in, t in terms of the legal rights that flow from the dissolution in particular, or for that matter, the half-baked system we have for dissolving these relationships, both marriage and partnerships, and I totally agree with him. We need a complete rethink in relation to uh, marriage, marriage relationships and partnership relationships uh, so that they match what we all want now, not this kind of archaic nonsense. So if I may be a bit cheeky then, why did you call it the Marriage Foundation? <laughs> well, as I've said to you before, it's a, it is slightly shorthand. What we're really interested in is quality, committed relationships, particularly parental relationships. And we call it Marriage Foundation for two reasons. One is it provokes interest by the press instantly. <laughs> and so we have, you know, the, 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 the clue is in the title. And what you get is what, you know, that, that is what is in the tin. Uh, but actually, it's a, it's, it, if I may say, is, is a more, more nuanced approach. We are fundamentally about stability within families, which is, generally speaking, as a matter of statistics found within uh, the, marriage po the marriage population. But of course, there are dozens and hundreds of people who live in stable relationships, unmarried or in partnerships or of one kind or another. Nowadays, there are even cohabitation agreements. And I would be in favor of all forms of uh, a cohabitation agreement. I'd be in favor of prenups. I'm perfectly happy for people to make sensible arrangements before they enter into a lifelong commitment about what should happen when they uh, bring them to an end. Absolutely fine. A very good idea. Mostly they, they're quite popular now and I, I come across them quite a bit. And I'm, I'm, people should be allowed to craft the committed relationship that suits them and uh, it should carry with it whatever legal consequences on dissolution they think is right and fair and proper. And we should not get hung up on the, the one, uh, on the one-size-fits-all model that we've had uh, since time began. We are surely a more sophisticated society, and we don't go into fault now when we... We shouldn't have to go into fault now to dissolve these things. It should be a simple process for civilised uh, people to... Uh, sort out for themselves. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peter and Claire, do you want to say anything about polygamous marriages? I'll say something briefly. Yeah, yeah. so, I mean, I think with the... Uh, I mean, my perspective is that the state shouldn't recognise any kinds of marriages, so therefore it shouldn't recognise polygamous marriages. Um, I don't think the state has a role in um, legislating to enforce monogamy um, in relationships either. Where the state does have a role is in ensuring equality and the protection of the vulnerable... Um, in relationships, which often will mean women. And I think it should do that for women in all kinds of relationships, monogamous, polygamous, or, or whatever that might be. Um, I think polygamous relationships often have been very patriarchal, but they needn't be by definition. So I think we shouldn't get sort of focused on the, the structure of the relationship. We should be focused on the status and equality and protection of the people within it. Um, that would be my perspective on that. Yeah. Peter? I just add to Sir Paul's observation about um, women not being able to own property or wives not being able to own and inherit property. Um, we also should remember that it was only about a decade ago that marital rape was made unlawful in this country. So there's a lot of, lot of baggage continued for a long time. Um, in terms of polygamy, I mean, I have a friend who's, who's from a Mormon background and he assures me that there is considerable informal polygamy existing today in Utah in Mormon communities. Not, not universally. Um, it's not state-sanctioned. It's informal. They may have their own blessings and ceremonies, but he assures me he personally knows... No, you're quite right, Peter. There, there are extreme groups who are sort of live out in the desert, yeah. and they still yeah. do have that. But it's very, very frowned on by yeah. the mainstream uh, community. Yeah. But having said that, I think basically polygamy is an expression, historic ex expression, of misogyny. Again, it's another aspect of the male sexual control of women, that a man can have as many wives or X number of wives as he wishes... But, of course, the reverse does not apply. So it is deeply imbued with uh, misogyny and means that women are 
in those relationships very much in a second-class status, and they are played off against each other. Um, so I think it's a very backward and um, reactionary institution. Um, having said that, I will also say that, um, uh, let, let's deal with anecdotes and exceptions. Um, I have um, three gay friends who this year will be celebrating their 30 years together. <laughs> They've lived together as a threesome in a loving, committed, three-way relationship for 30 years, I think in June this, this year. So it's not impossible, and it suits some people. Um, the final thing I'd say is it was raised about um, the forthcoming issue with the civil partnerships legislation on Friday. Um, if any of you are interested, please go to my website, petertatchell.net, petertatchell.net. There is a, a, a full briefing about Friday's uh, debate on the website there, the main our first item. At the bottom, it gives you four things that you can do, four practical things you can do to try and, first of all, spread awareness about the issue and the debate, but also to lobby your Member of Parliament. Members of Parliament are very open to and influenced by lots of pressure. So if any of you want to do that, please go to the website scroll down to the bottom and you'll see these four things that you can practically do to help on Friday. Thank you. Fantastic. So given the way that the debate is going so far, I think I'm going to take our two uh, final parts together. So what I'm going to ask you all is whether the state ought to promote or endorse, however you want to understand it, marriage. And if not, what are the alternatives? If not, what other thing do you have in mind? And I think we'll start with Claire. Okay, thank you. So, uh, yeah, my view is that the state should not um, recognize marriage, and there are two main reasons for that, two main principles that underlie that argument, um, and those are equality, which is for me the most important principle, and, and also liberty. So when I think of the equality argument, it very much starts with the historical um, inequality of marriage, which Peter has been talking about. So marriage is profoundly a sexist and heterosexist institution and has been in, in very deep ways, as, as Peter outlined. So women haven't been able to have their own legal property, their own legal independence, haven't had um, freedom from rape within marriage, and so on, as Peter's suggested. Now, you might think, well, those legal aspects of inequality have been reformed. And so we no longer need to, to worry about that. That's something from the past. But marriage is fundamentally a symbolic institution. It gains a lot of its, um, its, its weight, its importance, its influence from its status as a tradition with symbolic weight and import. And so it, it necessarily connects back to that unequal past. Can so I just interrupt you? What about, what about Peter's point that we scrap the word, we scrap what it's called, so, uh, and, and, and we have a, okay. a brand new uh, partnership arrangement which has right. nothing to do with the baggage of the past. Is so, there any validity in a registered partnership without any old baggage? So civil partnerships are an improvement on marriage in that respect. They're not much. And I, I support the Equal Civil Partnership campaign very strongly. So one of the benefits of the Equal Civil Partnership campaign is that I disagree with you say it doesn't matter what you call it. It does matter what you call it. And that change in name is an important signifier of a, yeah, yeah, of a no, break yeah. from the um, sexist and heterosexist um, traditions of marriage. So it does matter. I think it makes a big difference. So I support that campaign. But it is not enough, in my view, because the equality critique um, of marriage is not just based on its historic past. It's also based on the necessary aspect of recognizing particular relationships and ways of life above others. So any recognition of marriage or of civil partnership however reformed, necessarily enacts a hierarchy between relationships that do and don't have that status. So it necessarily says there is something different about a relationship which is a marital relationship or a civil partnership relationship and a relationship which doesn't have that legal status. And that can enact a hierarchy between relationships that are as it were, functionally identical but do and don't have that status but it also enacts hierarchy between people who are in relationships and people who are single and people who are in the kind of relationships that are recognized by marriage or civil partnership and people who are in different kinds of kinship relationships who 
structure their family form around networks of other forms, of, of siblings, of broader families, of friends, and so on. Now, why does that matter? Well, it enacts a hierarchy and inequality between people, but it also enacts hierarchies and inequalities between their children who haven't had any say in the matter. It, it acts a sort of stigmatization of people and their children who are not in the, the sort of respected form of relationship. And it may also enact a legal inequality in the form of unequal legal rights and duties, and that's a problem. Now, same-sex marriage and the recognition of same-sex marriage has been a fundamentally important egalitarian campaign. And again, as a political campaign, I wholly support the move from different sex only marriage to including same sex couples within marriage. So it's an important reform, an important move towards equality. But again, it's not enough because it doesn't do anything to undermine that basic idea that there is something special about marriage. And indeed, within um, lesbian, gay, and queer, queer communities, there has been a lot of debate as to whether marriage and same sex marriage actually is overall a progressive or a regressive move. Because by focusing on, on marriage, there is a danger that that entrenches the idea that there's something uniquely respectable about married relationships and that people, including same-sex couples or um, lesbian and gay people who are not in committed relationships, who aren't married, retain that, that stigma and that inferiority. And that's a real problem. Now, so equality is, for me, one of the real problems with any state recognition of marriage or civil partnerships. But the other issue is, is liberty, is the respect for autonomy and for different ways of life. So in recognizing um, marriage as being a particular way of life that it endorses, the state necessarily says that it's better than other forms of life, and that undermines people's autonomy and ability to um, feel that their family form and that their, their structure of, of life is something that is equally respected by, by others. And the bundling nature of marriage is partly what's responsible for that. Because in providing legal rights and duties and recognition through marriage, the state's saying that the various relationship practices that it regulates that way should go together. Right? That it's both normal and appropriate and right that you should share property with the same person that you have children with, with the same person that you migrate with, with the same person who is your next of kin. That all those things should be bundled together in one relationship. And for many people, those things are bundled together in one relationship. But for many people, they are not. So in most Western liberal democracies, approximately 50% of children are born to married parents, which means approximately 50% of children are not born to married parents. Some of the parents of those children will live together and will combine their, their relationship practices in a marriage-like position. Others will not. People divorce, people separate, people have different ways of life. For many people, they will be parents together with one person, they will share property with somebody else, they might care for somebody else, for an elderly relative or a friend, they might have financial dependence with a new partner. These different forms of relationship and different practices of relationship are not always bundled together for all people. So that idea that we should think of the marital form as the default way of life simply isn't apt for a great many people. Now, I think when we think about the benefits of marriage, the things that marriage is good for, the, the things that it, it, it helps, the benefits claimed for marriage are generally not about being married. They're about something else. They're about having a stable relationship or having a committed relationship or a loving relationship. They're often about having a certain socioeconomic stability. And when we're thinking about protecting the, um, those things that are good for people, that benefit people, that contribute to human flourishing, to the welfare of children, we should be looking directly at protecting those aspects of relationships that are necessary for that, not using marriage as a proxy. Because using marriage as a proxy simply highlights those relationships where everything is bundled together in a neat traditional form and leaves aside those relationships where those practices are not, are not bundled in that way. So you asked me what instead should happen. So one alternative that's often proposed to regulation via marriage is contracts. And we had a suggestion of contracts as being one um, possible way of, of going about it. I'm not an advocate of relationship contact, contracts as the appropriate replacement for the legal regulation of marriage. Um, and the reason why is that 
Firstly, contracts cannot replace marriage. They can't be the only way of regulating relationships because many people will not make a contract. And so we still need to have legal provision for people who are in relationships that need regulation who haven't made a contract. And if we're going to be making legal provision for people who haven't made a contract, it seems that that legal provision should be fit for purpose for everybody. Why would we need to legally regulate people who haven't got a contract or who aren't married in a, an official state-recognized way? Well, because there's many aspects of relationships that have to be legally regulated, either because they concern things that the law has to have fixed. We need to know who owns something. We need to know who is responsible for this child. We need to know who is the next of kin. So we need regulation for those kind of matters. We need to know facts about certain aspects of relationships. We also need to regulate relationships insofar as they are, um, they are ways that people become vulnerable. So many relationship practices make people in relationships vulnerable. The most obvious example of this would be um, the woman who doesn't earn money out by working outside the home, who devotes her life to caring for children and for, um, for the home, who depends on a male partner for her financial security, and that is a position of extreme vulnerability. And we need state protection to protect women in that situation to ensure that should that relationship fall down, they are not left financially destitute. So that would be an example of a kind of vulnerability that the state needs to, re to regulate. The real problem with regulating that kind of vulnerability via marriage is, of course, that people who are unmarried do not get the legal protection they need. And that example I just raised is a serious problem of vulnerability for women um, in the United Kingdom, where most people in the UK believe that a woman in that situation will be considered legally as being in a common law marriage and will have legal protection, whereas, in fact, common law marriage doesn't exist in law. So there's a real discrepancy between beliefs and the reality of the legal situation. So the solution, I think, is to ensure that people in positions of vulnerability, who engage in practices that need regulation to protect them and to promote equality, should have that regulation regardless of marital status and regardless of the presence of a contract. So the way to do this is to first identify which relationship practices need regulation, either because we need to know facts about them, you know, who owns this property, or because we need to ensure a protection from vulnerability. We then need to work out what the best, fairest, most just way is of regulating those practices. And then we need to apply that regulation to everybody who is engaged in that practice, regardless of whether they are married, regardless of whether they have drawn up a contract. In other words, we need to think, what would be the fairest way under this condition where we recognize marriage? What would be the fairest way of regulating unmarried parents, unmarried cohabitants, unmarried people who are financially dependent, unmarried people who want to migrate together? What would be the fairest way of regulating those people? And then we should apply that regulation to everybody, regardless of marital status, regardless of any other feature. And that would be, in my view, um, a far preferable um, set of regulations from the point of view of equality and it would actually do better to promote the values that we want to promote of ensuring that vulnerability is avoided and people are equally protected. I could see Paul is itching to come in here. <laughs> Just a quick question for you, Claire. Mm. So, so how, how would we tell then whether, for example, let's say we've got a couple who have been living together for five years as friends. They're sharing a house, they're renting together, and then at the end of five years, they decide they don't want to live together anymore. And now one of the friends says, right, I think I should be entitled to half of your income from that period where we were living together because, uh, you know, I feel that I did loads of the, the, the work around the home and the other person says, but we were just friends. We weren't in any kind of romantic, loving relationship. So how would you protect people who don't have any intention of being in any kind of committed relationship from falling under the kind of regulations that you're talking about? Well, the first thing to say is that we face exactly the same problem under a marriage regime. Right, the problem of how to regulate relationships which are not marital is there regardless of whether we recognize marriage or not. It's just that the way that that kind of question tends to be solved under a marriage regime is, is simply by not offering protection to people in vulnerable relationships. So we face that problem and that question regardless of what, whether we recognize marriage. Um, with respect to 
the particular example that you give, it's not obvious to me, it would still be up for debate, whether the mere fact of cohabitation should bring with it legal rights and duties. I don't have a settled view on that question. We'd have to think about each particular relationship practice on its own merits. I we but just, let's, we're just but let's, saying if I, that, if that I the finish, cohabitants did, if I should finish, have rights. I'll explain. But let's say we decide that we think that actually cohabitation is the kind of thing that should bring with it legal rights and duties. Let's say that that's the position that the state concludes is the fairest position. Well, there could still be, and should still be in my view, the ability for people to opt out if they think that their particular relationship, their particular practice, does not appropriately fit under that, um, that regulation. The difference under the, from the current situation would be that that would be an opting out of a set of legal rights and duties and legal protections, which would then therefore have to be done with clear, informed consent. Whereas the position now is you have to opt in to legal rights and protections, which leaves people very vulnerable when they think they have rights and protections that they simply don't have. So there can still be room for diversity, but through opting out of the protective function of the state rather than through having to opt in and having to get agreement from your partner to enter into that protected situation. Okay, great, thank you. I'm longing to leave, read Claire's book. I hope she's going to give me a copy tonight and <laughs> sign it. Um, because I think it's very uh, provocative what she says in the nicest possible way. It makes you really do, does really make you think about what, uh, what the state is doing. Uh, there are at least three major illogicalities in what she has said. Number one, I mean major Number one, she supports civil partnerships, but she doesn't support marriage. If she read the Civil Partnerships Act, she would see it is verbatim, verbatim, the Divorce Reform Act. I mean, nothing is different except, I think, as Peter said, in one very small respect in relation to the dissolution. So, and, adul and adultery. Ad well, that's what I mean. Adultery is not... Consummation and adultery are not included. Absolutely. That, that, that is a particular norse because of gender problems that existed at the time. So I support so, civil partnerships en route too. It's it's no, Recognising it, civil partnerships is better than recognising only marriage. Better still is to recognise neither. It's not an illogicality. It's a, it's a pragmatic... Well, all I'm saying argument. is you shouldn't support him at the moment because the act at the moment is actually... As he says, it's marriage light and it has all the problems that the current divorce reforms have. So your signing up to one without the other is, as I say, is illogical. The, the other thing that I find completely perplexing is your attitude towards cohabitants' right. Now, the moment you walk into that uh, absolute maelstrom of difficulty, because I can tell you I've grappled with it for my entire professional life, you're into huge problems. And the idea that you're, you call yourself a libertarian, but in the next I don't, breath... I do not call myself you, you, libertarian. But in, the next, but in your... <laughs> sorry, I withdraw it. You, <laughs> but in, in the next breath, you say, ah, but if you live together and you, that creates vulnerability, you should uh, have a recourse against your partner. Well, that is what this whole debate that's going on at the moment about whether cohabitants uh, should have rights is all about. Is it, is it fair that people... I mean, take an example... People in this room, they're living together with their girlfriends, their boyfriends, whatever, and uh, it, it happens to suit them. They may have a sexual relationship. At the end of it, they may move off uh, as, as partners and set up home together, but they've never in any sense thought of themselves as a long-term committed uh, partnership. Now, why on earth is the argument? Should two people who choose to live together with or without sex, and it's got anything to do with it at all, why on earth should there be a financial obligation one to the other if that relationship comes to an end? Now, that's the argument. And I have to say that from Marriage Foundation's point of view, we have always veered to that side. We think it is completely wrong for people who choose not to enter into a legal relationship when there are plenty of ways of doing it should then be saddled by the state for, with obligations towards someone they happen to have lived with. Now, you say, well, of course, it, it, that can create vulnerability. Precisely, precisely, that's exactly what it does do, because unfortunately, only women at the moment can have children. And as we all know, once the children come along, nine times out of ten, it's the women who are disadvantaged because they want to anyway take time out 
to bring up their children, certainly in the early years, so their financial position is hugely disadvantaged. And that is why some kind of legal wrapper is much the fairest way of doing it, so that when that relationship breaks down, if there has been financial disadvantage caused by the, uh, caused by the relationship, particularly driven by childbirth and the formation of families and the rest, the, the, the state intervenes via the courts and says, um, and says that has to be redressed in one way or another. Now, uh, I have sat in court many times uh, and tried to find a solution where a woman, for instance, has spent 20 years of her life bringing up four children in an unmarried uh, arrangement, and then it breaks down. And what has she got to show for it? As Claire says, nothing at all. She has no rights at all. Now, is that fair? No, it isn't fair. It isn't fair. And the question is, is that unfairness, which affects quite a small number of people, actually, statistically speaking, it's actually quite a small number, because there are other rights that people get. Uh, is that fair? It isn't fair. But I think the greater fairness is to not intervene in people's lives if they don't choose to make a legal commitment via marriage or partnership. Now, does the state intervene? As far as I'm concerned, not unless children are involved. I think that if people want to have whatever relationship they like, like Peter's friend, who there are three of them, absolutely fine. If people want to live in a commune of 50, it's of no interest to the state at all. The whole dynamic changes when children are brought into the, pic into the picture. Then we all have a stake, okay? We all have a stake in the way children are brought up. If you, as parents, make a hash of it, the state picks up the pieces. Yesterday, yesterday, as it happens, the latest financial statistics for the cost of family breakdown were published by a very well-respected organization called the Relationships Foundation that tracked this year by year. It's now running at 51 billion pounds, up from 37 billion uh, uh, only as recently as 10 years ago. And that is the fallout from broken marriage and broken families, broken relationships of all kinds. And that is why the state has an interest in stable families. And that is why they should encourage stability I totally agree it isn't, totally, it isn't always found within marriage. Of course it isn't. We all know, we all know the horror stories about broken marriages. As I say, I spent most of my life looking at them. But um, they, they, they're horrible. But the fact is, and the data is clear, that they are far more vulnerable, these uncommitted relationships, than the, than the committed ones which are uh, then put inside some sort of wrapper in one way or another. Don't let's worry about the details. And can I just make my last equality point, and it's a very, very important one. People always say, well, uh, the wonderful thing about unformed, unregulated cohabitation is that everybody is equal, and there's no, there's no patrimony, there's no nothing. Actually, that is not what the research shows. There is always someone in an unformed relationship who is in a weaker position than the other. It can be the husband, it, it can be the man, it can be the woman, it can be, there's always one, and, and it's, it's the principle of what's called asymmetric commitment. If you have two people who form a relationship and take the typical uh, 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 male-female partnership, almost always the female commits in a very real way much, much quicker and, and, and more deeply than the male which means that from then on, the female is very, very often in a weaker position. Why? Because the man is much less committed. Now, it takes a male, normally it takes a man a great deal longer to get to the stage of wanting to form a permanent uh, lifelong relationship. And that is demonstrated by the fact that the average age now for marriage is uh, 33 for uh, men and 35 for women. In fact, I think it's even higher than that now. But it, it, it is, people are taking much, much longer to commit, men, and that's because men are taking much, much longer to make up their great minds about these things. But actually, <laughs> marriage, marriage is the great leveler because when you both say, well, we've, we know what's gone on over the last six, seven years when we've been living together, we want to start again with a, with a committed relationship 
recognised in law one way or another. Everybody starts from the same position. They're all at the starting line together. And from then on, you do not get that inequality of commitment, which actually is the great driver of break, family breakdown within the unmarried community. Okay, thank you. I'm sure everybody is itching to come in. So before we do that, we're going to go to Peter. If you could keep it short, Peter, and then we'll bring the audience in for some questions. Well, initially, I was veering much closer to Claire, but now I'm veering a bit more closer to Paul. <laughs> um, I think there's no doubt there needs to be some kind of legal framework, whatever you call it, however you divide it, some kind of legal framework to set out rights and responsibilities to ensure protection for those who are vulnerable when things go wrong. There's no doubt about that. And whatever way you mix it, if you accept the principle of some kind of legal framework, that involves the state. So the idea of the state should butt out just doesn't work because the law is the state. Um, I should say that, as you probably heard, you know, I, I do very much share the uh, feminist critique of marriage. Uh, I'm very critical of marriage, historically in particular. So some of you might be asking, well, why did I champion the battle for same-sex marriage? I wasn't about to ask you that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it wasn't because I was a great fan of marriage. It was because I was a great fan of equality. Because the ban on same-sex marriage was homophobic discrimination. And therefore, as someone committed to equality, my recourse was automatically to fight that discrimination, as I would fight discrimination against women, black and ethnic minority people, disabled people, anyone. So it was, for me, it was simply about <coughs> ending discrimination. Not just the discrimination in law, but the discrimination in the minds of people that that law reinforced and reflected. So to come to the current impasse, which is where I'm sort of veering more towards Paul, is that in many ways, I agree that there is a strong case for saying, as Claire suggested, everyone ought to have these rights and responsibilities. Whether you're married or not, everyone should have them. Because that would protect those who are vulnerable and those who are not married. But the problem is, that is a state imposition. What you're suggesting is a form of state imposition, because you're saying the state is going to say, yep. everybody regardless of who you are, regardless of what relationship or status you have, you have these rights and responsibilities that are going to be imposed upon you. And I think that is not only state intrusion and imposition, but it's profoundly authoritarian. I mean, people should have the right to not be regulated if they wish. That, of course, does run the risk that people who are vulnerable will be left out. And it is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balancing act, but I think I err on the side, on, basically on balance, on the side of those who say, there should be no automatic state imposition. Now, Clara suggested that there could be an opt-out. Well, still, this is, has to be through a state mechanism. Mm -hmm. you, know, yep. you have to opt-out, and you have to sign a paper and everything. But again, what about people who forget to opt-out, or people who think, well, this is only a temporary thing, you know, it won't last, you know, it's just a, a, you know, an arrangement for the moment, and they don't take the time to do the opt-out. And why should they be forced to opt out from something that the state says you are obliged to do, or these are rights and responsibilities that you're obliged to have? Why should a person be forced to opt out? Um, what I want to do in the next session is, is talk about my alternative model, which I'll, so I'll save the rest of my time for that. Well, I think you should say it now, Peter, because we might not have time okay. later to get to it. So do let us know what's your alternative model. So if we were starting from scratch, I don't think the marriage or civil partnership model would be the one we go for. Um, it is too rigid, too inflexible. It's a one-size-fits-all model. And it doesn't reflect the huge diversity of relationships in our society. So some people live together, others live apart. Some couples share their finances, others have financial independence. Um, some have children, others don't. There's lots and lots of diversity, and I think a system of relationship rights and responsibilities needs to reflect that. I think also we need to perhaps move away from the marriage model and think about the right of a person to nominate any significant other in their life. 
Now, it could be a partner, a love relationship, or it could be a lifelong best friend, a favorite niece or nephew, a sister, a brother, a carer, because we know that there are many non-sexual, non-romantic relationships which are very committed and enduring. You know, I know of two elderly women whose husbands died. They've set up house together. They live together. They support each other. They do all the kind of functions and support that a marriage would do. And I think to myself, well, why shouldn't they have rights and responsibilities? Why should they be penalized in terms of inheritance if one of them dies? Because only in a marriage or civil partnership do you have the tax-free inheritance perks that go with those particular arrangements. And that is discrimination against single people. So under my system of nominating any significant other, a person could do this whether they're in a marriage relationship, a civil partnership, or whether they're single. It ends discrimination and disadvantage by uh, the state against those who are not in civil partnerships or marriages. Um, under this system, you nominate any significant other and you make your choice. It's your choice. It's your right. Now, when it comes to people in love relationships, I think there's a good case for saying that people should have a, be able to pick from a menu of rights and responsibilities to create a tailor-made partnership agreement. Now, obviously, some rights and responsibilities would have to go together, like tax and social security. But basically, under this system that I'm proposing, you can nominate any other person as your next of kin and beneficiary, and you can pick from a menu of rights and responsibilities to the, each to the other. And what this would mean is that you'd have to go through each right and responsibility, and both of you would have to sign it off. So it would actually make for a more informed recognition of what people are getting into, and I think perhaps <laughs> result in perhaps wiser, more responsible decisions. <laughs> Whereas with marriage or civil partnerships, it's just there. You just sign it, and that's it. There's no negotiation, no discussion, no thinking through the obligations and commitments. But Peter, you're forgetting the prenup, which has now come into existence in the last 10 years and has led to a complete rethinking of the way people uh, design their partnerships. I mean, I've come across them. They're, they're, a lot of them have been shipped over from the States, the models. But, but yes, I mean, people take a great deal of time and trouble designing a, a relationship and rights and so that suit them, including things like, if I don't get sex X number of times per month, you get less money. I think that would not be upheld by the English court. But I'm just telling you that it... it all I'm saying... I don't think that's a very sensible idea myself. But... Um, all I'm saying is that it enables people to really think very hard, as, as Peter says, about what they're doing before they enter into this committed uh, legal arrangement. Well, hold that thought for just, just a that, moment. Just, just one point. I probably didn't quite explain it properly. I mean, under this system, when you nominate the significant other, whether that's a, a love relationship or not, you both write down a pick and mix from the rights and responsibility. So it applies to everyone, not just people in marriage-type relationships, the, the close friends and others as well. The problem is what happens when the powerful member of a relationship refuses to sign off mm. on the rights that would protect the vulnerable member. And that's the problem mm. with that arrangement. Mm. OK, thank you very much. What we're going to do is bring you in now, and then we'll come back to our panel to defend their positions. So, questions... We'll start with this gentleman over here. Can we get the mic up to the top? This mic this up to the top. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to uh, push a little bit on the, the disagreement between Paul and Claire, because it's not clear to me what the principled uh, reasons, Paul, that you might have to object to the position is. So as I understand uh, your position, the Marriage Foundation's position, you're primarily interested in children and the protection of good families for the benefits of children. Um, and as I understand... Uh, Claire's critique of marriage, it's to say that the state shouldn't be engaged in granting special status to certain relationships, and it shouldn't bundle rights together such that you only get them in this kind of all-or-nothing package. And as far as I understand the Marriage Foundation's position, you don't care about status, and you don't care about bundling, you care about the particular rights in the cases of children. And so it doesn't seem to me that there's a principled, very large gap. It seems that perhaps 
you might have a practical issue, which is your overriding concern is with children, and you think contingently the statistics show children do better under marriage. And that's fine, but that doesn't seem like quite as strong a, a principle uh, disagreement as perhaps you phrased it initially. So I wanted to just push a bit on that. I'll, well, take, I'll take a few more okay, questions. Do, do. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we've got one here. Um, well, thank you. My question is for Sir Paul. So in the beginning you said that um, statistics show, shows that um, if you ask people between the age of 14 to 18, uh, like the main aspiration in life is to have a strong and stable uh, marriage and reliable marriage. And you said that some of that was down to biology, but don't you think that it's possible this is not a biological thing, that it's something conditioned by a society in which marriage has been part of the tradition rather than biology? Okay, thank you. And we're going to take two from the top. I said that, Carol Vorderman. Um, this lady over here. Thank you. I have a question about civil partnership for heterosexual couples. So my impression so far is it doesn't tackle some problems existing in marriage at the moment, such as uh, traditional gender rules would still exist, and uh, there will still be women's free labor in domestic life. So would you say uh, by introducing the, the terminology a civil partnership creates a different sentiment and psychology? Uh, which can help the situation. If not, what, be, what, what would be your solutions to this? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the gentleman there, if you could pass it along. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, I very much like the idea of a lifelong commitment. It's a wonderful thing, particularly if it can be achieved, if. However, I was also listening to uh, what Sir Paul said, um, lifelong commitment, but prenup. And that sounds a bit like a paradoxy or an illogicality, isn't it? So how many of these prenups or short-term relationships, limited companies, marriages are we supposed to have? Two, three, five, ten? It, it becomes quite paradoxical then, doesn't it? Okay, great. So, so there's this issue. Is, aren't marriage and civil partnership different? Because marriage has the, the kind of expressive and symbolic baggage that civil partnerships don't. And then we get the question about what's, what's really going on here? Are we worried about the children? Are we worried about something else? So I'll put those questions to all four of you. I'm going to start with Claire, and then we'll come to Paul, and we'll end with Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things that I think is really interesting when we talk about lots of the benefits of marriage and when, and Paul, you talk about the things that you care about in the Marriage Foundation, you talk about lifelong commitment and stability. It seems to me that the, the, the relationship which is the most stable and the most lifelong commitment is the relationship of parenthood. And I sometimes wonder why parenthood isn't the relationship that we should be exalting. Why don't we have... Um, a state-sponsored ceremony of parenthood? Why do we have strong norms about the commitments of parents? So I do wonder when marriage is used as a way of defending children's interests, why we don't think about parenthood? So why don't we don't structure our norms around that idea that it's the commitment that the parents make to the children and the commitment they make to each other as co-parents? which may or may not be coextensive with the commitment they make to each other as a sexual partners or, or whatever it might be. So I think that's, that's the, a real question for me. Whenever we think about children, why isn't it about parenthood, not about marriage? Um, I agree with the person who said that the desire to get married is not probably biological but cultural. I think that's absolutely right. Um, and the question about whether civil partnership has a different psychology, I mean, that's, that's my hope is that having a civil partnership sort of terminology is distinct from marriage enables some of that shift away from the kind of patriarchal history and, and implications of marriage. That's my hope. I'll be brief to know Oh, thank time. you. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I'm going to agree with Clara on uh, her relation, in relation to her last answer. Uh, it, it is interesting, isn't it? We spend a lot of time tearing our hair out about the difference between civil partnerships and marriage. The fact is, it is a psychological difference. At the moment, it is a psychological difference. It is really not a practical difference or a legal difference. And the reason for that, of course, is that when this was introduced as a precursor to the same-sex marriage legislation, which came in much, much later, uh, Parliament wanted to produce a model that looked in every way like marriage, but was called something different. So it, it is, in fact, in legal terms, identical. I mean, if I try a case, or if I tried a case between uh, a same-sex couple, 
the law is identical, that the case law is identical. So there is no difference. But there's a psychological difference. I mean, if you talk to the couple who are going to the Supreme Court, as I have done, and others who, have, uh, who feel very strongly about this, it's about feeling that I'm not a husband or uh, a wife. What difference does it make? Well, it is all about how you feel and, and what you call yourself. So I, I, I think there is a difference there. In relation to what was said about... Um, um, about me being in the, really the same, not being very different to what uh, Claire said in relation to the uh, children. I'm afraid I disagree with you about that. The, the, the first thing to remember is that, as I said before, marriage is very successful as an as a, as a, as a arrangement. Whatever may be the statistics, the fact is if you get married tomorrow, you have a 60% chance that you will remain married to that same person for the rest of your life. In other words, it is highly probable, highly probable that your marriage will last and only uh, seriously possible that it will come to an end. In other words, it, it is still, it is still it, it's a huge problem, of course, but it's still the norm that most people who get married stay married for the rest of their life. Therefore, and again, the statistics in relation to marriage are very, very clear. They, they do last longer and children do do better in stable relationships. Does it matter if the parties are married? Does it affect the quality of their parenting? Not really. I mean, there's a little bit of nuanced research about that, about <laughs> children's mental health. But does it really affect them? I wouldn't even bother to, myself to argue about it. What we want, what children want is stability. And if you don't believe me, go and sit in a family court any day of the week if you can get in, and you will find that the one thing that children say always over and over again monotonously without fail when they are consulted about their arrangements when their parents relationship comes to an end what do they want more than anything else for mummy and daddy to get back together again that's always what they say first it's very heartbreaking. I am quite sure there are people in this room who have themselves experienced family breakdown in one form or another because everybody has now, either directly or indirectly. It is no laughing matter. It affects people's lives for the rest of their life. And as I say, I went to this lecture last night and it emphasized it again that we don't think enough about the effect of family breakdown on adult children. So it isn't just a question of rights and responsibilities. It's about raw human pain and the damage done to people's lives by having their parental relationship smashed apart. And if we can produce a, a, an arrangement, I don't care what you call it, which leads to people saying, we're going to stay together, we're going to bring these children up together, we will have a healthier society... Oh dear. Thank you very much. That, thank you. That, no, thank you very much. You're quite thank right. You. I thank shall you. shut up. You've totally dominated it. All we ever had was your voice. Well, I'm very sorry. I, 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 Okay, okay, thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. very much. Thank you for the contribution, thank yeah, you. He's had more than he is, you've had okay. more than your... All right, thank right. you very much. Thank right. you, Barbara Parkinson. Well, I, I think I better stop. He likes to do statistics on other people. No, thank and you, but no, it's, excuse him. me, excuse you me, no, thank you. You a third of the conversation. Okay, sorry, sorry. I thank won't speak again. Okay, well, I think we'll, go, we'll hand over to Peter for the final word. Thank you very much. We're nearly done. Just to pick up on what Paul has said, he has said several times that marriage is much more successful than cohabitation and cited the figure that 60% of people who marry will stay married for the rest of their life. And at first that sounds a very good, positive thing. But you must also ask, the question about the quality of those marriages, mm -hmm. and I looked to my own parents' marriage, which lasted until death, but was not a happy marriage, not a good marriage for me and my siblings. So I think you know, we need to bear in mind that longevity is itself not an indicator of the virtue of marriage. Um, just to become Claire's point, she said one of the problems with my proposal was that a powerful person would refuse to sign off 
you know, the particular rights and responsibilities. And she's absolutely right. But that would surely be the warning signal to the other partner that perhaps this is not the relationship that should be entered into. And at least the person knows, whereas with going in unseen with marriage and just signing a little line, you've got no clue seriously about what the other partner may think or do in the future. The final point, I, someone over there asked about civil partnerships. I couldn't quite get the drift of what the question was. The question was about the symbolic difference between okay. civil partnerships and... No, not that one up there, the one over there. Oh, well, okay, we'll pass it. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was the woman who walked out. No, 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 the, one who, the one over there was stagging me off. You didn't say anything. <laughs> All right. Wow. Didn't expect it to end like that, for better or worse, richer or poorer. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, we had a wonderful discussion. Thanks to our panel. I just want to reiterate the point that the next forum event is going to be at the Royal Institute for Philosophy rather than the LSE. So let's just thank our panel and thank you for a good discussion.